are many, many. Good. <laughs> there are many, um, um, three, only 320,000 compounds in all metabolomic databases combined. Um, that includes HMDB and many other uh, databases. And if we think about mass spec libraries of small molecules, there's only about 100,000 compounds that actually have validated and curated MSMS data, uh, experimental data, including, for example, from NIST 20 and other libraries. So um, most of the compounds we would see in a non-targeted screen are likely to be unknowns. So when we give a now a name to a peak, how confident are we that this name is actually correct? And for that, we need to look into a little bit like our expectation, our biological expectation. So when we um, look in, for example, uh, the human, um, human uh, biofluids, for example, blood, but also maybe tissues, you know, we usually think about the metabolome as endogenous pathways. And in any given time, you might have a thousand metabolites and maybe 5,000 lipids, you know, because there are lots of lipids. Um, but that's not all. So we understand that we live in close proximity and co-evolution co -evolution with uh, countless microbes uh, that do a lot of metabolic uh, reactions with us. And some or many of those um, will be found in circulation, like secondary bile acids, short chain fatty acids and many, many other compounds and actually have effects on uh, um, human diseases. Next, we also know that there are many enzymes that um, modify uh, metabolites. Just as you have protein uh, translational, uh, post-translational modifications in proteins, we also have um, subsequent non-canonical transformations of metabolites, we call them epi-metabolites because they are like adjacent to. And these are acetylations, methylations, oxidations, and so on. Some of them are very well known, like oxylipins. There's a many um, um, decade-long research just on oxylipins, but there are many more that we just now discover. Next, we have, of course, food. Um, so we eat food, um, and some or many of those will also show up in the human. For example, in uh, coffee, um, we have the caffeine. We like it because it, we have caffeine receptors. Um, and so the question is, how many more of those micronutrients would be found in circulation? And what are the effects, apart from affecting the microbes, what are other direct effects? And some of them are known, for example, for agosterol. Next, um, metabolites can break. Just as you can have proteins that break and genes that break, well, metabolites can break too. Anything that, uh, that can break will break. Um, you know, for example, an ADH you know, can be oxidized. Um, we have about 10 to 20 papers about this topic um, in a team uh, effort with uh, Andrew Hansen in Florida. And the idea is that you, we identify specific repair enzymes. I will not talk about this, just giving you a flavor why metabolomics is more than just endogenous pathways and pathway mapping. And last but not least, we have the xenobiotics. There are at least 10,000 chemicals that are produced at one ton or more per year. And many of them, we expose ourselves voluntarily, for example, pharmaceutical agents, but also shampoos, deodorants, and others. Um, some of them involuntarily, like flame retardants or dyes from shirts, and then, of course, the uh, environmental factors. So all these can show up in human samples. And that poses an enormous uh, task on non-targeted analysis for identifying these. So first of all, how do we, in my lab at least, cover the metabolome and the exposome? Um, these kinds of non-targeted analyses are um, facing different aims. So we want to have an ultimate coverage at very high quantitative accuracy, um, very high speed, but nobody wants to pay for it, right? So these are conflicting aims and we have to navigate our landscape in this, in this uh, um, you know, through these conflicting aims. Um, and event, that's why there are so many um, different methods in metabolomics, because, you know, it depends on where you focus on. Um, in our lab, we um, have kind of locked down our methods, for example, for lipidomics, uh, using a 2.1 millimeter, 1.7 micron column, 10 centimeter. Could it be five centimeters? Yes, but we would lose some resolution, right? Um, we use about 30 microliters of plasma, for example, 
um, in biphasic extraction with MTB and methanol water um, so that we get the lipids first and then uh, the polar compounds we analyzed by uh, hydrophilic interaction chromatography um, and afterwards by pr the primary metabolites specific for sugars and hydroxy acids by GCMAS. But then there's of course compounds that are too low abundant to be targeted in this way. Um, there we, uh, for oxylipins, steroids, bile acids, and some other compound classes, we have targeted methods uh, specifically for these low abundant compounds. So that means we have tons of data. And when we think about how to identify compounds, we need to go away from just MSMS matching. Of course, MSMS matching is still an important part of experimental work. Um, you know, the classic chemistry work with accurate mass and so on, and libraries. But since there are so many compounds that are not found in experimental libraries, we have to embrace in silico predictions of mass spectra and in silico um, annotations of mass spectra. And I give you some types of software out there. But in addition, of course, we have to embrace um, um, or, or cover what is actually known about a biological specimen of interest, either experimentally from genomic databases, but also a priori from literature. So what do we know so that we have an expectation horizon um, in, for metabolites, but also for exposome compounds and so on. In addition, of course, you can then go one step further and do further predictions of these um, enzymes and um, that, uh, that you know are in a, in a specific tissue or in a specific organism and say, well, these enzymes might have other types of reactions, uh, catalyzed promiscuous reactions and so on. Um, and again, there's a, a number of different uh, databases out there, tools out there, specifically K-base for microbial enzymes, but also otherwise like Biotransformer, for example, for uh, cytochrome P450s and so on. So these are all novel tools that we have to embrace to give us a realm of expectation. So in terms of software, we have developed over the years uh, MS Dial, uh, starting with uh, um, a data independent analysis, so that's the uh, dial, but it's also, of course also possible for data dependent MSMS. Um, in the version 4.0 that we just published uh, this year in June, um, it can do LCMS or GCMS, accurate mass or nominal mass analysis, and also now includes um, ion, ion mobility um, predictions and ion mobility data in, in four dimensional ways um, so that you know, um, everyone can use it. It's freely available. Uh, you download it from Riken. Uh, Hiroshi Sugawa is the hero of this work. Um, so we had a long, long standing collaboration with Japan on this one. And you see, you see a, a snapshot. It looks at adducts, it does the alignments, it does batch reporting, easily to be 300, 500 studies, um, sorry, samples together. Um, no problem with, in terms of crashing, even on a PC. Um, but also the MSMS matching that you can see here for a specific triacylglycerol. And for that, of course, you need libraries. So where do you get MSMS libraries from? Of course, you can buy libraries like NIST 20, my friend Steve Stein, is the hero um, of, the, of the NIST libraries uh, for many, many decades, actually. And it's still the best curated database. But there are other databases out there that are freely available and online. So we made massbank.us as a library that encompasses all publicly available spectra. So if you have spectra, please upload. And you see here the growth of these uh, libraries over time. So HMDB still doesn't have so many actual mass spectra in it. GNPS is growing a little bit, but not as dramatically as some literature might suggest. Uh, mass bank in Japan and, and, and also in uh, Europe is growing somewhat, so we always exchange these. Um, but we also add, of course, our own experimental spectra. For example, here below you see the Vanilla Fiend Natural Products Library with 37,000 spectra. Um, and this will grow largely uh, next year. Uh, we just bought another two and a half thousand compounds and we're in the, um, from which we then generate both retention time data as well as MSMS data on both QX actives and QTOFs. And just to make it clear that people can download for free. In addition, of course, we have 
Um, in Silic predicted libraries, we started with Lipid Blast in 2013, but then we added glucuronide lipids, uh, FAFA lipids, um, carni lipids, uh, carnitines, and so on. And uh, the newest one actually in that, in that family is the Kobe Blast library. Um, so there are only 50 spectra in the literature um, um, available, so you can actually look at this spectra or download it, it, it from any repository. That, that's not many spectra for coas. But in the, in the published literature, there is uh, almost two and a half thousand uh, coas published as being there. So how would we find those coas if we don't have spectra libraries? And for that reason, we took the experimental spectra um, derived rules how the fragmentation would work and um, you know then the computational expansion of uh, the coase onto other assets um, predict there for 3700 spectra in coase blast and then use this in liver extracts to um, find certain coates. Now we see here sometimes we have very clean and good matches we'd say okay that's fine then you have of course medium matches where some Fragment ions are not predicted, and then you have dirty spectra. Everybody knows dirty spectra. And I always wondered, what is a dirty spectrum? I'll come back to that a little later. So first of all, um, the principle of MSMS matching, everybody has done it, everybody loves it. Um, you have an accurate mass, you have an MSMS spectrum, you have a, a downloaded um, library spectrum. Um, in my lab, in the service lab, they say, well, you know, we got to look at this every day. So by and large, we, we want to have at least three or more fragment ions. We then match the relative intensity, and then we get to do a human judgment. Uh, we also look into the experimental chromatographic um, extracted ion chromatogram, and if it's a good peak, we say, yay, we got it. Um, especially now, if it's, a, if it's a, a typical compound like valine, you know, there's no doubt about it. Or is there? Is this really valine? How confident are we when we declare this to be valine? And indeed, um, we sent out the data to our collaborator. The collaborator had an independent validation and said, well, all your data were fine, but not valine. Are you sure about that? So we went back and um, we, we did this um, specific experiment quite early when we just started with our Hillic uh, studies. And again, you know, this was actually not valine, it was betaine. So, you know, we could have said, well, there was this little, little ion here uh, that didn't match, but usually you'd say, well, come on, that's a good enough spectrum. Um, but indeed, valine, the internal, the actual standard of valine would, would elude um, half a minute later. So we need to have retention time to be sure. How do we get retention times if we don't have 100,000 compounds in the laboratory? So what we did here is we used all our retention time libraries that we have in massbank.us and built an app, uh, the RITAP app, um, in collaboration with Paolo Bonini at NGA Lab in Spain. Um, so then we used five different machine learning algorithms to use the um, known retention times and propagate this to substructures and those um, pre you know, predicted retention times. As we can see here, the uh, predicted retention times you know, correlate with the experimental retention times, but not very exact. So we have about a minute uh, retention time deviation um, that we have to expect and to acknowledge. Um, so at first I thought a minute retention time prediction in a 10 minute chromatogram, uh, that's not very useful until people showed me, well, you know, actually we can publish because we have a lot of neutral, um, sorry, um, false MSM is spectra with very good scores, as you can see here in this table, like carnitine 981 score, but the observed retention time would be 9.6 minutes. The predicted retention time, as well as the library retention time, is 7.6 minutes. So this is an in-source um, fragmentation. It's not actually carnitine, but something else that, pre that presents as carnitine when we have it in the MSMS. And similarly for others like that we give here. In fact, Many, many uh, compounds can be excluded this way. So 68% of false, false discoveries can be avoided this way um, if we treated everything as a novel compound. And up, and up to 26% were indeed um, removed this way by retention time prediction. So that's, that's kind of cool. Uh, we did it both for Hillic and also for reverse phase, but we didn't have so many um, different types of columns. The idea is now you have the ability to do it yourself. So we now uh, propagated that to the pentafluorophenyl column. And there we used 2000 
um, flavonoids and other types of natural products to do it again to predict retention times and validate those. And as we can see here, the predictions on the PFP is actually a little better. We have um, medium errors of about half a minute and more than 80% are found within uh, one minute retention time. So, so that's where um, we can actually be quite sure um, and, and use this for future studies. I, I said I don't know what a dirty spectrum is, and we are trying to do this online on, on Amazon's cloud. Um, and and we're there, we have to know what is, a, what is a good spectrum and what is a bad spectrum, good match and bad match, and what is a dirty one. So when we thought about it, um, the concept dirty doesn't exist in, in information science. In information science, it's called entropy. Entropy is both a physical chemistry term as well as a term in information theory. It is related to the peak numbers or the numbers of ions we see in MSMS spectra. As we can see here, the entropy is correlated to the peak number, but not linearly. And uh, when we look at the uh, curated NIST 20 database, we see that most spectra in the NIST database have about a, um, an entropy of one. So here is the entropy for, for example, lactitol to give you an example how entropy one would look at a spectrum. But there's many others also in this uh, library that have higher um, entropy values, like entropy three here. And indeed, even for entropy four, um, we see quite a number of, um, you know, still um, entries in the NIST database. In massbank.us, um, that is experimental data, and we have far fewer um, efforts in data curation than uh, Steve Stein's NIST database. Um, we see also, uh, you know, a big hump at, at, at about one, but also some other compounds at, at oh, more compounds at spectral entropy four, and maybe it is because we have more natural products than in the NIST library. Now, the GNPS is an, a library that entirely focuses on natural products. And there we have, uh, you know, even higher entropy values. Uh, Peter Dörlestein said, well, you got to curate them and you got to like cle clean out the spectra by removing low abundant ions. And I'm like, yeah, but then why do you publish those? I mean, you should just give us a curated spectra if, if possible. Um, so it's not quite clear yet if this is due, due to dirtiness or because there are more natural products. So we, then we thought, well, this is a nice idea, a nice concept. How can we use it for for similarity. So um, we, we um, asked the question, how good is dot product similarity anyway? Um, and here we compared uh, 40 different types of similarity measures against the dot product similarity and also introduced entropy similarity as a new concept. So entropy similarity means you have your target spectrum that you want to compare to the library spectrum. You merge both together and now you can compare the, um, or, uh, the target spectrum entropy versus the merged spectrum and get an entropy difference. This entropy difference um, can be expressed as an entropy similarity. And when we do this for 100,000 pairs of MSMS spectra, all protonated, both um, either on orbital ion trap or on QTOF spectra, what we did here is we removed the target spectrum from the library, then searched it against the library to find the same molecule perhaps at a different uh, collision energy, and we would call this a true positive. Meaning a false positive would be a different molecule within 10 ppm accurate mass. So most likely isomers, but there could be some isobaric in between. And when we do that, um, we get um, um, area under the curves, receiver operator curves here, where we see that in red, the dot product similarity is clearly outperformed by in green, the entropy similarity or in another version of dynamically weighted entropy uh, similarity where we give a little bit more weight to high M over Z values um, for either Orbitrap spectra or QTOF spectra. And indeed, entropy similarity works, uh, outperforms all other 40 um, similarity measures as well. Some of these similarity measures are really poor, um, but, it, but many others, including those that I just gave in the other slide, outperform dot product um, even there. So in our view, dot product similarity is not a good measure and should be replaced. Um, the question is now, does it solve all the problems? When we now look at the true um, or the, the false 
discovery rate, we see that even at similarity scores of 0.9, um, that means we have really good match. You look at the spectra, it's a really good match. Um, and I showed the betaine versus phthalene. So that's not an exception. It's actually 15 to 20 percent. It can be expected at um, you know um, one entropy or three entropy. And if you have very low information content, like not many ions, your false discovery rate it can be even 30 percent um, at at the po uh, point 0.9 similarity score. Um, so that means it does not al alone solve the FDR problem, um, but you also need, for example, retention time or ionability. Now, the question is, um, if that is not the correct compound, what is it? it? It must be quite similar. So we do understand that mass spectrometry um, has really trouble with positional isomers often. So this, this is not the perfect way. Um, so when we look at these two compounds, for example, they just differ um, in the position of the metoxy group, and we can expect an MSM spectrum to be very, very similar, and you know, any similarity algorithm be confused by that. So we ask the question when we do this for all the library's uh, spectra and only look for very similar uh, isomers, we had to first tell what is, what is similar meaning in, in terms of structure. Usually we use Tanimoto similarity scores where the different substructures are decomposed um, and then you just count. But if we do this for these two compounds, we see you know, they have both an aromatic ring, um, they have uh, both these um, methyl amines, they both have the metoxy groups, and many other groups are absent, so the Tanimoto score would be identical if not very similar. So instead, we use maxi maximum common substructures um, which is a graphical tool to basically look at all the bonds and see how many bonds are shared between two structures and how many are not similar. So here for, these, for this example, we have only one bond that is not similar, that is exactly the bond that sits on the aromatic ring. When we now do this for, uh, across all the libraries, um, all, the, all the spectra in, in this 20, we still see that the dynamic weighted entropy similarity on similar molecules, not just identical, but also these one bond similar molecules, clearly outperforms dot product similarity and improves FDR um, rates dramatically. Um, we have not published this. I'm kind of very really proud. Um, Yuan Yu Li is uh, the postdoc here doing this, and we'll have one more thing to do before we submit it to publication. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is how can we increase our libraries of spectra? So um, there are two ways in principle. In principle, you can do rule-based predictions like we did for lipid blast, where you interpret fragmentations, you make a rule, you make a big a library of compounds, you predict the ions and off you go. Um, but often enough, these rules are not very good. Um, not everything is a lipid. So the question is, can we do it by first principles using quantum chemistry? So here we used born Oppenheimer uh, molecular dynamics and uh, density function theory. And we started with uh, Stefan Grimm's method from University of Bonn in Germany, who um, in 2013 had a breakthrough paper for uh, GC electron ionization mass spec. So we, we, we use this uh, currently on over 500 compounds, get a 619 dot score. And what it does is you look at the different trajectories, uh, how an excited molecule can be fragmented. Uh, for example, we see this here. Uh, for this uh, quinone, and you see that the, you know we follow different paths of the trajectories and how they further fragment. Um, make many many of these trajectories, uh, combine them, and get an experimental spectra. And as we can see here, very often uh, these, these experimental spectra are very close to the predicted spectra. We have now propagated that to include silicon atoms uh, because in GCMS you often have to derivatize molecules to make them more volatile. And as we can see here, it also works for um, um, cellulated uh, metabolites. Um, sometimes you get ions that are um, you know, experimentally there, but not predicted in quantum chemistry. That means we have to find out for which types of structures does it work perfectly. Um, you know, which are a little harder. Actually, with oxygen uh, compounds are a little harder than others. Aromatics usually are a little better. Um, so we are uh, progressing on that. And uh, Shin Yang Wang in my lab has his first paper out. Um, it's a bioarchive, but it's also in journal chemical informatics, soon to be published. 
So then the question, I have a question which is don't mind Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I have a question regarding the spectrum. How do you mean that the intensity of this uh, QM DFT spectrum? You know, I can understand the mechanism of how the structure breaks up, right? But how do you get the intensities of the predictive yes. spectrum? Yes, so you have to do it many, 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 many times and you can accumulate, right? So it's basically, you look at a certain trajectory for a couple of uh, femtoseconds, I think it's about 100 femtoseconds, where we, we uh, look at that and see, um, I had a video at some point, in the next slide I'll show a little other video uh, that, that, that highlights it for CID. Okay, which is similar in CID. Well, not exactly similar, but yeah. So, in, but this in is a EI spectrum, right? Is that a EI spectrum? This is EI. Uh huh. This is electron ionization. Yeah, so this fragmentation comes within the source fragmentation. It is. It is. Yes. You first make a radical ion, and then yeah. uh, in a couple of femtoseconds, you know. But we femtoseconds is a long time. I mean, it doesn't feel like a long time, but in mass spec times, it's a long time. Um, so you, we follow all the trajectories, what happens after this excitation, absolutely, um, you know, um, with the energy in, in, imputed, and it actually works. So Stefan, it's not our method, so we have, uh, as I said, Stefan Grimmer developed that method and published in so, so, the internal, so, so the internal energy distribution was known for the EI spectrum? Yes. So you had to have the internal energy distribution of this particular molecular ion. Yes. And also all the breakdown curves of all yes. these product yes. before you get to the... Yes, okay. that's right. All right. So Thank it's you. really, it's, it's computationally intensive. I didn't show that here. We have it in our paper. Um, it works for compounds up to 50 atoms, maybe 60 atoms. So we try currently to uh, use it also on the Amazon cloud to get just more computer power. Um, it's a computational, for small molecules it works okay. The bigger the molecule, the more degrees of freedom you have, the more uh, things can happen. And then computation gets very, very intensive, right? So each of those trajectories, we usually calculate a week, you know, um, for, for one molecule. All right. Um, so we do the same, or we try to do the same for collision-induced MSMS. Um, because of course it's important. So there, I, I, I don't give all the details. Uh, my, my grad student, Jessie Lee says, well, I'm, she's mostly interested in the workflow and in the ways how to do it. And I am of course most interested in the outcome and the application. Um, but, but indeed, we try to do the same in, um, in collision due to molecular dynamics. So we look at the um, molecular dynamics really um, and, and then calculate that, um, how, it, how it works. So, so what we have to do here is we have to, we have to do certain approximations. So on the right-hand side, you see a molecule, um, in this case it's taurine, and in, in CID, this molecule would move through a gas. And this is hard to simulate, so instead we, we simulate lots of gas molecules hitting, hitting at, at certain energy. Um, our, our compound of interest. And if we do this, sorry, that's not what I wanted to show. I wanted to show this. If we do this with a, a specific energy, um, you know, it might hit and it might actually lead to a, a water loss, but then it would uh, just do a rearrangement as we can see here. And when we do a little more energy and we simulate uh, the dissociation, at some point you might actually lead to a water loss that is permanent. And finally, if you have even further um, energy, you will see, for example, here, a sulfate loss, the water loss, and other fragments. So this is what we simulated. And indeed, as you said, we have to do it all the time and uh, from all directions and at all different types of energies. So this is on the right-hand side, a simulation of, um, or combination of the fragments um, that we get from 300 collisions from different directions. Um, and, you know, that is just at one given energy. And then we do this for different energies, right? So because obviously it, it depends on which energy you use. And when we do this, um, we actually get the different energy curves or the different fragments for different energies. We've done it now for 
uh, I think five molecules in total, so it's not 500. It's not easily scalable. Um, one energy for one molecule get, uh, it takes about two weeks calculation time on the four core processor that we have here. Um, that's why we want to do it on the cloud uh, with more power. Um, but, but in principle, it gives us the first time some um, insights of what happens for mechanisms, but also maybe at some point for library generations for molecules that you cannot purchase. And that's the idea, of course. Currently, we just use classic molecules where we know how the spectra are. Um, one of our findings is, of course, um, that I don't show, it matters incredibly where you put the proton. So um, if you put the proton, for example, of an oxygen uh, atom, or if you proton um, later on on, the, um, on other um, areas of the molecule, it matters. You get actually different fragment spectra. Now, in reality, of course, protonations would be on different sites based on pKa. However, pKa's in the gas phase are not exactly easy to calculate uh, because you have high energy. So we look at the Boltzmann distribution there and try to figure out computationally uh, what, is, what are the most likely protonation molecules. In addition, of course, you could think about confirmers. We think our hypothesis is um, confirmer status is not so relevant. So like, like how is it uh, rotating or, you know, um, the different rotational uh, conformers. Uh, it is important for other quantum chemistry calculations, for example, for ion mobility, uh, but we think for collision induced, uh, the energy and the protonation sites are much more important. So this is just a, a little thing. Okay, so the next thing we did is, of course, we said, look, when we have so many unknown spectra and um, we need to identify them because many of them are um, biologically important. We need to be able to uh, restrain the search area of all these molecules, not, not look for 100 million molecules because then you end up in an enormous false discovery rate. So we need to, we need to be closer. And one of the things that can be fairly easily calculated is uh, the propensity of a proton uh, to be acidic, to, 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 to leave. And for that, of course, you can do experiments. So you could do a hydrogen deuterium exchange. And if you do this, um, here's an example for an unknown that we say it's C5H9NO4S. You would, in, in PubChem, you get the 353 PubChem entries. But if you know that this unknown has exactly four acidic protons, then you only get 29 PubChem entries. That means you have a 92% reduction in the search space. That means you have a better false discovery rate. That means you have better chances to fight the right compound. So what we did is we tested this concept first on 233 standards. Um, we did it on hydrophilic interaction chromatography because that's where we have the most unknowns. And first we did uh, just uh, run the helix with D2O. Actually, before that we infused D2O, but that was horrible, it didn't work. Um, not nicely at least. And what you then see, you have deuterium exchange up to, in this case, uh, five protons, but, the, but the, um, you know, the fifth proton is really low abundant. You can easily imagine if it's a low abundant compound, it might not show up and you would only see this and you would be falsely assuming you would have only four protonation sites. Um, instead, now what we saw is we, when we also add um, deuterated ammonium formate, um, we um, almost always get the most intense ion at um, the um, fully protonation state, um, much more comprehensive. And um, you know, we see this here for the 233 compounds. So almost always a full HDX exchange as being the base peak in the precursor ion. Um, but um, for some smaller, uh, for some fractions, we still see the full ex uh, HD exchange, but not as a base peak. But that's very promising. The next question that we ask is, uh, what about our retention times? D2O is not the same as H2O. Um, and you see this here, you know, for, for some peaks, we get the exact same or very similar uh, retention time. And for some, we see a little bit of shift. But in principle, the order um, remains the same. And we get about a half a minute shift maximum, more like 20 seconds uh, shift, as you can see in the lower slide. So that means in a non-target uh, scale, what we then did is we have to find our unknown uh, that is now deuterated uh, within about 20 seconds, plus minus. Um, 
and we um, then have to look for the similar, similar MSMS spectrum, deuterated versus non-deuterated, to, to uh, get the deuterated uh, version and calculate it. So when we did that, and we did it here on mouse tumors, um, we identified 100 novel compounds in addition to the 400 compounds we identified before through classic screening. Um, here are given just two unknowns. Um, you know, one had uh, uh, five acidic protons, the other had four acidic protons. And of course, with the accurate mass, you get elemental formulas. With the elemental formulas, you get potential structures. So just by knowing that we had, uh, in this case, uh, uh, five acidic protons, we removed most of the unknowns to only getting four. And then we used a um, mass frontier to annotate the acidic protons on the MSMS ions, on the fragment ions. Um, and because we know which fragment ion had how many um, proton shifts. So we, when we added that, only a single compound uh, was left over. And then we, if we can buy it, we can purchase the compound. And in this case, we see here two compounds that were actually uh, positively uh, verified by both retention time and MSMS. So this is the, the way how we can combine HD exchange with MSMS mapping to identify novel compounds by basically giving more evidence um, and, 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 and uh, reducing the constraint. So the next thing is, of course, so I said- I have a question regarding this uh, experiment that you did. What's the reduction in false discovery rates when you do this extra HDX on top of, so if you did the same experiment with the same set of compounds, what is the gain, uh, the reduction of FDR uh, in this approach compared to the standard approach? Well, I mean, if you, you we haven't done a true FDR calculations yet. But obviously, if you reduce, say, 90%, well, then, then it's much better. We, let me think about that. We, I have it, we have it in our paper. I have it in the slide that we have submitted the paper, as I said, 12 weeks ago. Um, so at least for the comp, we, we then treated the compounds that we knew, we identified before, as if we didn't identify that, right? Um, and we had a massive improvement in the, um, with this method um, in terms of the identification rates, we knew what it is, but you know, we, if we treat them as unknowns. Um, it's not exactly answering your question on FDRs. Yeah, um, no, the, the, the issue that I see here is like the retention time shift and how yes. that impacts oral identification as opposed to doing it in the actual native structure, right? So here yes, you have to account for shift retention time. And, and, so and that is unfortunate. You know, D2O is just not H2O. I mean, it is what it is, right? Um, can we, could we predict that this yellow compound would shift to the right and that this, uh, there was one that shifted to the left maybe, this one here, this dark red shifted a little bit to the left and this dark red shifted a little bit to the left. Can we predict this? We are not there yet. Right, for that, for these kinds of retention time shift predictions, we need, again, a big library to know uh, about substructures and how substructures, we haven't done that. With 200 compounds, okay. any prediction would not be good enough. Um, we have some feeling, but like carnitines act a little different and so on, uh, but it's not good enough. And, but on the other hand, we also know that for, for, through our machine learning methods that even the predictions were half a minute, maybe one minute even in Hillig, um, you know, window. So the retention time predictions are not very accurate at this point. Um, and yes, we get a little bit um, shift and we have to find it first. So at this point, it's mostly manual work. So this, in this case, my, my grad, former grad student, Clayton Blosis, who's now has graduated um, as, um, um, did, did it all, all manually. So we did a little bit, of course, computational work, we had some workflow, but it's not on the scale of uh, press and play. Uh, if that answers your question. You still look skeptical. Anyway, uh, let me continue because, uh, well, we are at 40 minutes, so I, I, but I don't have much more to say. Um, good, good start in the discussion. So the other way to look into the, or constrain the search space, uh, it is by understanding what do we already know. Um, in genomics, it's easy because you know the genes and sequence, they don't, they don't change, right? 
but for metabolites and for exposome compounds, anything is possible. But on the other hand, while anything is possible, not everything should be quite as likely. Um, so what we did here, the first is we're just asking how many chemicals have ever been reported in the literature as being found in blood. So this is a question that can be answered by text mining. So we did here uh, with text mining on 28 million abstracts and 6 million full papers. Um, of course, again, you can have more papers. Um, this is actually hard to get all the papers due to licensing issues. Um, and when, then we did three approaches in terms of getting the molecules, the text mining PubMeds to PubChem and PMC to PubChem for the full papers. And then the chemical synonyms, because people would name them any way we like, chemical synonyms back to PubMed. So overall, we had uh, collected 14 million synonyms that we looked at. Um, and from these 14 million synonyms, we then uh, concluded that there were 850,000 publications that talked about um, detection of metab or chemicals in blood. Um, of course, we had inclusion and exclusion shingles. It was a fairly simple um, um, approach to text mining by using words and word shingles and not natural product language um, processing. But with this approach alone, we got 42,000 unique 2D, stru 2D structures um, that have been reported. It's all in the database. You can look it up. Um, about 20,000 of those uh, compounds were published 10 times or more. So they are more likely, and 3,000 of those compounds were published more than 3, 000, uh, more than 100 times. Um, and of course, there are compounds that are published just only once. Are these true? No, it could be a false positive. We don't know, right? Uh, but at least it gives us some idea when we now take untargeted metabolomics and untargeted exposomics to say, well, of course, these compounds, you know, um, could be there again when we look at blood. Um, and looking at 42,000 structures is much better than looking at 100 million. You know, PubChem uh, uh, has 100 million compounds. So that is just, many of them are just not likely to be there. Another way to um, look a priori of what is possible is by making good experimental databases. In metabolomics, um, there is the metabolomics workbench and metabolites in, uh, in Europe and metabolomics workbench in the United States, it's actually not quite easy to navigate those databases. Um, so we think we need very highly curated atlases and we started doing this work. Um, so here we present uh, the metabolome atlas of the aging mouse brain. Um, we have more atlases in the pipeline. And this work was done by my postdoc, Jundi. Um, and here we see um, we, we, we identified 1,700 metabolites in 10 different uh, sections, micro sections of mouse brains over 59 weeks of aging in both male and female mice. And we can see here just by the example of adenosine um, that uh, metabolites are expressed or you know, found, accumulated in different brain regions at highly different rates. Um, and that this can be changed also over aging. Um, so we think that such kind of atlases also give a good background of, you know, um, thinking about disruptions of brain metabolism and what to expect in brain metabolism. Um, and of course, you have many more tissues and many more cells and cell types and can always go to more spatial uh, recognition through, through, for example, through mass spec imaging. However, um, usually with mass spec imaging, you don't have so many compounds. Um, and also, you know, of course, not so many tissues uh, or not so many different aging types. So there is um, uh, pros and cons for each, of, uh, each approach. And I think this kind of atlases fit a ne uh, nice niche on, uh, in understanding what is already known in metabolism. Um, then we have the need for scaling or normalization of metabolomics data specifically for large cohort studies. We published um, systematic error removal using random forest with the idea that you have every 11th sample, you in, um, include a pooled quality control sample that you use for um, normalization. And we showed that 
um, SURF um, massively outperforms the classic lo uh, locally estimated scatter plot smoothing. Uh, as you can see here, the PCA would still have unexplained variants on the pool QCs, whereas with SURF, you know, the, you get a really low technical errors. And you get, of course, completely remove all batch effects and drifts as well. As we can see in the raw data, lots of batch effects and drifts. So once you have all these statistics, how do, what, do, what can you do with metabolomics? And how can we actually use metabolomics in, uh, in scale? The first of all, of course, you use lots of statistics. And we always use lots of statistics. Um, we also think that statistics has, serve different purposes. So for example, we use principal component analysis only for quality controls for outlier QCs. We uh, use PLSDA and other machine learning methods only for class if we have actual classification or biomarker questions. And most of the time we use univariate statistics in all forms of manner from aggressions to uh, classic uh, Wilkinson rank and so on. However, we also understand that metabolites um, are correlated to each other. They are not independent events. So um, therefore, people want to do pathway enrichment. And we critique the classic pathway enrichment uh, software uh, from HMBB MetaboAnalyst because metabolic pathway databases are incomplete. Pathway definitions vary widely. Uh, MetaboAnalyst uses the inappropriate hypergeometric test, which can only be used if you have a, a standard set of known compounds and not different uh, names of compounds. Um, and so we instead say you could use a chemical set enrichment statistics using chemical similarities. We give here one example for a mouse study in diabetes, uh, where you then display the sets of met metabolites that are differentially regulated in uh, upregulated red, downregulated blue. Um, and the ball size would be the number of compounds that are involved. So with that, um, then people want to, you know, do multiomics. Um, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit over time now already, 47 minutes, not too bad. Um, and they want to use genomics, proteomics, metabolomics all combined. And we always wanted to do that. So about 10 years ago, my friend Carsten Denkert and I had a, a common grant uh, in Germany. Um, where we looked at ER positive versus ER negative uh, tissues actually in women. And we did proteomics and metabolomics on them. And we can, then you get these maps of upregulated, downregulated proteins being in hexagons here, uh, metabolites being in circles. And you look at that and you think, how can we publish this? Now we had several papers out of this study, but usually uh, by slice and dice. So you talk about one protein or one metabolite or one gene. Um, because the integration uh, looks nice, but it, the question is how do we get information from that? Um, so we now think we have one way to uh, do this apart from just showing a screen by looking uh, not only in proteomics and metabolomics, but adding the gene expression uh, studies, which are available in databases. So you can just download gene expression studies on ER positive versus ER negative. Then we looked at genes, metabolites, and proteins, and how they all uh, confer conferred to specific uh, ultimate genes and which of these genes were already reported in the literature and studied in the literature. So some genes are like uh, P10, uh, P53 or P10 and AKT, they are you know, so often published. And in this case, for example, CD44 published over 1,400 times, um, but we found 10 genes that um, are differentially regulated on metabolite, protein and gene levels, but basically never studied in the literature. So this is one way you can use multiomics by finding novel targets that are of potential interest because they're differentially regulated in a specific biological context, um, but that are totally understudied and that can be studied in, in, in more detail by other researchers. So that's one way how to, uh, we think multiomics can be used. So, in conclusion, I have given you a lot today. I have given you metabolomic databases and software, MSDAL and MassBank and other free software. Um, in my lab, we have 18 different tools and software um, that's all free on our website. Um, 
Um, MSMS is great, but we think you also need to reduce tension times, you need to reduce FDR calculations, and you need to remain skeptical. By the way, we don't have decoy databases yet really in metabolomics. I know that protein people, they love decoy databases. We just don't have that really. It's not quite easy to come up with a chemical molecule that cannot exist or that we know it's not existing, right? And then match it. And that's a little harder for us. Everything is a little harder in metabolomics. Um, Biological background, well, we you know, have two examples here, um, text mining as well as experimental databases. And for interpretation, we think, again, you know, chemical enrichment is one way to go. Uh, context analysis here, for example, in multiomics is another way. So I'd like to thank my international colleagues, Paolo Bonini and Tirosh Tsugava, uh, as well as all my, all my team members and many others who are not on that slide, as well as, uh, of course, funding agencies, specifically NIH and NSF. Uh, who funded uh, different parts of the states. So now let's have a discussion. Thank you for your attention. Yay. <laughs> and we're still 51 minutes, not too bad, I hope. Yep, thank you very much. That was a, that was a lovely talk. Um, it looks like we have, uh, we can open up the floor for questions. Perhaps first we have uh, one question already in the chat box that I can, uh, that I can start off with. Um, so we have a question here uh, for you. Is, is there any work uh, that's being done in forensics uh, metabolomics that you're aware of? Well, as much as forensics relates to toxicology, in toxicology there's lots of metabolomics. If toxicology relates to crimes, I am not sure. <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, I, that's, I haven't looked it up. I haven't heard about it. <laughs> All right. We'll open the floor for, for any other questions. If anybody, if you do have questions, please feel free to uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and, and ask away. We have yeah, some yes, questions. While, waiting, um, while we are waiting on questions, uh, I have a few questions from your uh, discussion on, um, dot product versus entropy um, based yes. method that you described. You know, if you look at the uh, receiver operator characteristics of the two that you, you showed, uh, it seemed to me that, you know, uh, the sensitivity gain that you get from the entropy similarity is very marginal. If you look at the sensitivity or, or the area under the curve of the rock analysis, uh, between the green and the blue, it's almost identical. No, no, it's the, the red and the, uh, the, the red and the blue. Red and the red blue. dot product. Red the red, red dot red product. Is, okay, red is the dot product, and the green is yes. entropy. Okay. Yes. So a, a blue and green is both entropy, um, and just like one is dynamic weighted entropy, which is like mass weighted, right? And, and the dot score is, of course, also mass weighted dot score, just like Stephen Stein, 1992, did. Um, that's a classic, now the classic weighted dot score. So the red one, the AUC is really better, um, absolutely. So you get a, clearly fewer false positives. Um, I have, we have many more graphs, of course. In any given talk, you can't show all graphs. So my postdoc gave me about 50 graphs or so, and then you have to select some of making them suitable, um, um, maybe, you know, then showing F the FDRs. But the point here is, um, even with really good MSMS similarity, you only go so far, right? Um, yeah, here was the other one, like where we had even for similar molecules, right? The dot, dot product. So we think dynamic weighted entropy similarity is much better. However, it doesn't solve the problem. That's my take home here. You know, even if it's much better, it doesn't, you can't say I identified the compound based on mass and MSMS. <laughs> yeah. So um, did you use retention time as a covariate in this analysis? Or no, it was no. no. Retention time is completely similar, um, separate. So that's why in my lab, of course, we have locked down methods where we have standards and ejected. But we, we inject like maybe a thousand standards or maybe 4,000, yeah. but we can't inject a hundred million, right? That's yeah. why we, we- Yeah. In the case of this particular example, I would imagine that the author or the meta positions would show a difference in um, maybe the retention time, right? 
These two actually wouldn't show. They, they, they very, very yeah, similar. So. so usually these isomers, these kinds of isomers at least, show very little different, uh, differences in retention time. So um, okay. what we so you, did... Do we consider CCS values as a, as a uh, predictor? Of, yes. Of, so, uh, differences? So, so first of all, we have in-source uh, in fragmentation. In-source fragmentation is a huge problem in small molecules. We don't, of course, know how big the problem is, but we can start looking at it. And this is a, 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 a view into our in-source fragmentation because the MSM spectrum were very nice, but the compounds were wrong because they had completely different retention times. And that happens if you have a, something that falls off easily, like a, like a glucosyl or so, right? And you have just the wrong collision energy, uh, sorry, um, ionization energy in a vector spray, um, and then in source you fragment it. Um, CCS is something that we have a grant running, a shared instrumentation grant, so maybe we get an iron mobility next year, but we just don't have an iron mobility instrument in the lab. Um, so some other people have looked into this more closely, for example, Tom Metz at Pacific Northwest National Lab, but also a range of other like Zhu has a really nice CCS library, predicted CCS library. Um, this can be done in metabolites. Um, it is used. It is not quite clear yet what the additional FDR is or the additional benefit. Um, so Corey Bruckling from Colorado has done simulations on CCS values uh, on the scale of the NIST 20 library, or no, on the scale of the Keck library, and found that um, you would need 500 resolving power and on the unmobility to kind of really resolve things. Um, but even with 100 resolving power, and that is stuff that uh, the current um, um, QTOF from Agilent, the iron mobility QTOF, or the broker iron mobility can do, um, or the cyclic IMS from Waters. So 100 to 150 resolving power already gets us some of the way, but again, not only that. So, you know, we think it's the combination um, of retention time, iron mobility, and MSMS that ultimately will reduce the FDR scores and give us more confidence. Um, we don't have an equation for that yet. So Tom Metz and I, and uh, Tom Metz in uh, Pacific Northwest uh, are heralding this and we are computing it and we, I don't have an I-mobility yet. <laughs> so if you are a reviewer, please be gentle. My grant will be reviewed in four weeks. <laughs> and, uh, you know. Um, okay, and further questions on anything? I mean, I, we covered a lot of mass spec ground. Usually I don't talk so much about mass spec. <laughs> Most of the talks are given biological context. Great questions, Harsha, thank you. Um, I, I have a question. Yep. Hello? Yes, Stephen, I hear you. Yes, um, ver very nice talk, thank you. Um, the Bettine, what was it, the Bettine and Valey mm -hmm. example, I think you showed, um, you know, just a, a, certainly a startling example. Uh, and I've seen that uh, with, stere you know, stereoisomers. I mean, that's not too uncommon. But, but I guess, I mean, in this case, it's a structural isomer as opposed to a stereoisomer. Yes. How, how common, or I mean, can you, can you say how common is this? Well, that's what I try to do with the FDR calculations, right? Yeah. You know, when you have an MSMS, you match it and, and some other isomer like pops up, right? So that was the difference on where entropy is a little better than dot score, right? Mm. Uh, mm. You know, and then we can say, that was then my next idea was, okay, well, some positional isomers are really different and some positional isomers are really similar. Like that was the idea with the uh, one bond is different. Uh, where is that? It was here, right? So these are two isomers that are really, really similar, except for one bond, like just one position of the mm. metoxy, right? And, and, and even then the dynamic weighted entropy similarity gave us a better uh, FDR, right? Well, and, but I, 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 I would assume the tandem, the spectra are very different. 
Oh, no, no, no. They are very, very similar. Uh, huh. These kinds of positional isomers, uh, I would say, I mean, I have not looked at it, but these, I, okay, uh, next time for you, I will do it. But no, yeah. for, for these types of positional isomers, they are very similar. Absolutely. Now, it, yeah, so is this a classic tandem as opposed to an ECD or? This is classic CD. Mm -hmm. I, well, of course. Not ECD. Yeah. Not ECD. Can't be ECD, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, uh, I mean, that, that Vatine and the Valium, was that published anywhere? Oh, well, the spectra are public. I mean, yeah. this, this is just an example uh, where I was wrong. I love to punish myself and I rather point out my own errors and flaws, not other people's errors and flaws. <laughs> so that's where we proudly claim to find Valine and it was completely wrong and we're very embarrassed. And that's why I make fun of myself now. No, it's um, a wonderful learning tool for sure. Yeah, and it's, it's yep. a good example, right? Because they actually, the spectra look really good. I can't blame my staff, uh, you know? As a PI, you would usually go and blame your staff and, you know, how stupid they are. But, you know, that was my stupidity. Well, but I guess if those two peaks that were different in the, yes. in the, between the two spectra yes. were much bigger. Yeah, would then, you, you would, then you would, yeah, of course, right? Right, these, so the, these, are, these yeah. are library spectra in, in a way, of, well, one is an experimental, but usually if you have a little iron like that, you know, that could be noise. The spectra never got quite perfect, right? I mean, this is pretty close, and usually you would ignore these little things, right? Mm. Yeah. Fascinating. And what we found actually, we, we asked ourselves, why is the dot product not as good as the entropy? What is the real reason? It appears to us is that the dot product um, kind of downweighs low abundant ions much more than entropy. Right. So that what the, the experiments we are doing right now, I didn't want to talk about it because I don't have the results, but the experiments we are doing right now is now we take the spectra and we artificially add noise. So now we make noisy spectra, um, different types of noisy spectra, of course. And then we ask again, is dot score or entropy better? Right, because that is something we feel like a reviewer might ask. Uh, actually, uh, this was a tweet, Twitter comment that we got uh, when we uh, had a poster. Some people said, oh, how robust is it? And I'm like, oh, robustness talks about noise, right? Having ions that in the experimental that actually are not real, they might come from co-eluting isobars that co-fragment or co-eluting isomers that co-fragment, right? Right. You know, um, and then you have these weird ions popping around and you never quite know what to do with them. But you usually ignore them to some extent, right? Um, so, yeah. So w one tiny little suggestion on this spectrum, you write down three plus fragment ions as a, to a mass spec audience that looks like triply charged ion. Oh. <laughs> so I think if, if you put in a greater than sign next to yeah, the Okay, three, yep, all right, you are right. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just a little trivial thing. You know, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just, just like giving, uh, giving you ideas like how do my people, when they, they actually manually, I mean, you got to like manually look at the spectra for all the studies we do. And we do about 300 to 400 studies in the service lab alone. So then they la have to look at manually. I hate that. I want to do it automation, right? Um, and my people want to do automation, right? So that they can focus more on other stuff. Um, so we try, that's the idea between my service lab and the research lab, that the research lab comes up with cool new ideas and new workflows and algorithms. And when they work, we deploy them, we publish, of course, and then we deploy them so that the service guys, like here, Brian Roberts, uh, would benefit. And also, of course, our service um, outputs is getting better. So, right. Yeah. <laughs> well, I could tell you 30 years ago, we had to do it all manually. <laughs> yeah. No, but honestly, you can only look at so many spectra in your lifetime. <laughs> uh, anyway, further questions. Oh, they are. How to apply methodologies if we need to use several instruments, GCMS and LCMS, for the same sample? Good question. So first of all, we do this all the time. So usually we have um, three methods that are the most often used. So we would have the complex lipids, the biogenic amines, and the primary metabolites. And we basically have three workflows and three different 
expectation horizons in a way. Uh, we do fractionation. Um, here we do even derivatization. And then we combine the data for the um, um, interpretations, right? And now assume that we would have the same compound in hillig MS and the GCMS. So there's some overlap, for example, for amino acids. <clears throat> then what we then do for our services is we um, only keep those metabolites that have the, the best uh, precision. So we, that's why we have our quality control pools so that we would have uh, percent RSD values so that we can exclude those compounds that are, um, have a worse uh, percent RSD or are really low abundance or both. Um, so yeah, so that's, we, we do it. We combine these, not the methods, but we combine the data uh, when we send out the results for a given study or a given sample. That's very unfortunate. I would love to just use one essay, one column and one mass spec <laughs> and get all metabolites on this planet. But this is uh, hard because the metabolites can be really small or really large and really non-polar and really polar. Uh, it's um, in metabolomics, you have to use different essays. I don't like it, <laughs> uh, but that's unfortunate. All right. Does anyone else have any other questions? I know we're running a bit late, but uh, Oliver, I don't know if, if, if you've got a couple more moments to, to answer any questions. Yeah, I, I'm here. I mean, I'm of course virtually in another meeting as well. So sometimes I look there, but I'm not speaking at that meeting today. So <laughs> I took a break from that meeting. <laughs> and they have a coffee break, as I can see right now. Well, then I guess if, uh, uh, if nobody else has any other questions, then we'd, again, we'd like to thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, for taking the time. And thanks, everyone, for, for taking a few moments. I know that some of you have already dropped off, but thanks, everyone, for taking a few moments to, uh, to join. And um, if, uh, as we mentioned previously, we, we did record the, uh, uh, this, and we plan on um, uh, posting it on our Delaware Valley Mass Spec Discussion Group uh, website. Oliver, yes. thank you very much. We really appreciate yeah, it. If people have questions or comments or suggestions afterwards, send me an email. Great. Well, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you. Bye-bye.